Well, we're into another round of elections and another wave of Islamophobia and racism. And I don't just mean in Britain. Obviously, just across the water in France, we've got Le Pen, a vicious Islamophobe, into the second round of the presidential election over there, a very frightening phenomenon. And then over here... Obviously, in Britain, we've got a whole series of various Islamophobic parties fighting it out for the top spot in the general election. And obviously, both UKIP and Le Pen draw on the Islamophobia that's been whipped up by much wider parties over a very long period of time. Um, and if you think about in Britain, this has come not just from the Tories in government, but also from the Labour Party um, in government, particularly under Tony Blair's government, if people remember, who made quite an industry of the um, Islamophobia that he instituted. Um, we also see, as we know, an increase in not just attacks in the press and attacks from politicians, but in this translating into actual physical attacks on Muslims, um, in particular on Muslim women who seem to be at the brunt of every wave of Islamophobic violence that we see in Britain. We see also the witch hunting of migrants who come often from predominantly Muslim countries such as Syria, who are witch hunted as potential terrorists or as sex predators editors potentially. We've seen the repressive legislation in things like the Prevent Programme, which people might want to discuss more um, when, when we come on to, to discussions. We've also seen in the US Trump's a, a, attacks on Muslims both before the election and his attempt to implement anti-Muslim policies since the elections. I'm not going to go on about this. Basically, we all know it's bad. We know it's a bad time to be a Muslim. And we know that there is a vicious Islamophobic agenda. We all know that. And we're all part of campaigning against that. So what I want to do really in this meeting is to try and look at a little bit deeper than just what's going on and how we can fight it, then try and understand a little bit about where Islamophobia comes from, how it operates, its different arguments, and why it is that sections of the left haven't been as effective as they should have been at being able to counter Islamophobia. So the first thing I want to start with might seem like a really basic thing to everybody here, which is the point that Islamophobia is a form of racism. And I say it's a basic thing, but every single time I do a meeting on Islamophobia, somebody will tell me that this is a live argument with their friends, with their workmates, with people around them, that there is still an attempt to deny that Islamophobia is actually a form of racism, that it's about discrimination, racism and persecution, rather than just being about a question of, of, of the right to criticise religion. I can give you a couple of examples. The former French Prime Minister, Manuel Valls, described Islamophobia as a fabrication of Iranian fundamentalists and an attack on republicanism. Not an extreme position in France, as we're going to go on to discuss. There are lots of people in France, not just on the right, but also on the left, who think that Islamophobia is not a real uh, term or something that we should be talking about. In Britain, um, the writer and broadcaster Kenan Malik argued more than 10 years ago in a very influential essay at the time called The Islamophobia Myth. He wrote, and this is a direct quote, there is a fundamental difference between race and religion. You can't choose your skin colour, you can choose your beliefs. And he goes on to argue that it, if it's okay to criticise other belief systems, to criticise liberalism or Marxism or conservatism, why isn't it okay to criticise religion? But obviously, racism is not just about skin colour. And one of the big mistakes that he misses here is that race isn't a real thing at all. Race has always been a construct, a social construct, based on ascribed characteristics that are ascribed to different groups who are then discriminated against. And it can take lots of different forms, and it has historically taken lots of different forms. So if you think about just the recent history of racism in Britain, it's targeted Irish people, as we've already talked about this morning. It's targeted Jewish people. It's targeted black people of African or Caribbean descent. It's targeted Asian people from all sorts of different descents. And another big target that we see, that we mentioned in the last session, is Eastern Europeans who are targeted by racism in Britain today. So we can see that racism changes, and it isn't just about the colour of somebody's skin. And it's not new that a group who are officially defined by religion should actually 
see that religion racialized, if you like, and should face racism. I think the nearest type of racism to Islamophobia is the question of anti-Semitism, where you saw Jewish people facing exactly this same sort of process of the racializing of a whole religious group. And for Muslims today, just like Jewish people facing anti-Semitism in the past and today, it doesn't matter how religious somebody actually is. This isn't actually about somebody's particular religious beliefs or how they practice their beliefs or how religious they are or they aren't or what their theological position is. People are ascribed to a particular racialized religion. They are, they are seen as Jewish or they are seen as Muslim and that is seen as a, as a closed entity in and of itself. And in actual fact, when you look at how Islamophobia works, Islamophobia bears all of the recognisable features that we would understand for modern racism. It's full of stereotypes, isn't it? In fact, the fact that all in Britain, pretty much all Asians are seen as Muslims, regardless of what their actual religion is, and all Muslims are seen as terrorists. So that you have a situation where actually lots of Sikhs and Hindus are also mistaken for Muslims, not to mention atheists and agnostics and all the rest of it. Um, the writer Aaron Kunnani, who has written this fantastic book, Muslims Are Coming, a book that I highly recommend to anybody who wants to read more about how Islamophobia works in, in the modern, modern age, talks about how in America, actually a lot of the common depictions of Muslims in cartoons is wearing a turban, something that's actually associated with the Sikh religion. So a complete distortion, but this is the caricature that's created. Muslims also face institutionalised discrimination and disadvantage. Uh, disadvantage in employment, in every stage of the criminal justice system, um, in education. Some of this, obviously, is because of the way in which Islamophobia overlaps with the ethnicity of people who are already facing discrimination because they're from Asian or African backgrounds. But it's also been the case that every study that has looked into employment prospects and naming and people's names when they apply for jobs has shown that if you have what is seen to be an overtly Muslim name, you're less likely to get a job than an equivalent person applying for that job. It's also true, as I said earlier, that Muslims face racist violence Every time there is a terror attack, we see a recorded um, increase in uh, racist attacks against Muslims as Muslims are collectively punished for what is seen as a, um, a wrongly seen as a Muslim problem. Um, Muslims face suspicion and blame and have been constructed as an alien community who don't integrate. I'm going to say a bit more about this in a minute, but in much the same way that Jews in the first decades of the last century were constructed as an alien community um, within much of the West. And like all other forms of racism in the modern world, Islamophobia comes from the top of society. It comes from the state. We look at, only have to look at some of the, the policies, such as the prevent policy, which permeates through the whole of the state, the media, through politicians. It absolutely comes from the top of society. And one of the interesting things, I think, about Islamophobia or anti-Muslim racism, whatever you want to call it, is that it combines some of the oldest forms of racism with some of the newer forms of kind of cultural racism, if you like. If you think about after the Holocaust, when ideas of biological racism were discredited, uh, although they always make a comeback, and we can talk about that a little bit more um, in a minute, there was a change, really, to the language of racism that stopped talking about biological racism and started talking about culture and people with a different culture and people not wanting to integrate. Um, this is not new, by the way. If you think about Margaret Thatcher back in 1978 was actually talking about how Britain faced being swamped by those of a different culture. So this argument has been going on for, um, for a little while. Islamophobia in Britain and across Europe predates, and in America, predates the war on terror. In, in fact, it came from a lot of these arguments about culture and integration. But the current phase of Islamophobia that we face today, I want to argue, is absolutely hinges on the question of terrorism. It's been boosted and transformed by the war on terror. And I think this question of linking Muslim communities to terrorism is absolutely at the centre of defining Islamophobia today. And there are three real ways, I think, that Islamophobia works today in terms of an argument, and they're all interrelated. So I'm just going to quickly sketch out each of them. And if people want to draw out some of these themes a bit more, that would be brilliant in the discussion. The first one, as I say, is the question of terrorism. Because the question of radicalisation and how 
people become radicalised and why it is that some people carry out these extreme um, attacks of terrorism uh, has been something that's been poured over in the press and by media pundits and all over the place. And generally from the government, from policymakers and from the press, it is seen that there is somehow something inherent in Islam that encourages terrorism. So Muslims have been constructed as a complicit community. You, you think about all the things that David Cameron was saying about Muslims are quietly condoning terrorism and all the disgusting things that he said um, to attack um, Muslims as a whole. So Muslims are collectively seen as responsible for any act by a Muslim in a way that nobody else would be, in the way that no Christian is held collectively responsible. Well, for, for example, for the acts of Tony Blair, a self-professed Christian who killed millions of people, and many people are still suffering in the Middle East through the acts of Tony Blair. But we don't say that this is a Christian issue and that we demand that all Christians should have to um, apologise for this. The same with other cases of individual terrorism by less high-profile and less powerful people. There is no collective responsibility unless you happen to be, it happens to be something that is committed by a Muslim. We also see the total decontextualisation of terrorism. So any of the real reasons why violence may be created around the world through war, through racism, that there may be a blowback effect from some of those things in terms of, race, in terms of terror attacks, none of that is ever discussed. It's all pinned on there is something inherently wrong with Muslims. But we know a lot of these things, and I don't really probably need to tell people this um, in any in any great detail. The second argument, really, I think, that Islamophobia puts forward is around the question of integration. And this is linked to the question of, of terrorism because it's all about creating this picture of an insular and isolated community that is harbouring terrorists. And so we see repeated arguments that Muslims aren't or don't want to integrate or embrace what are called British values. Now, we know that this is a nonsense. Every single survey that's been carried out looking at social attitudes shows that actually there is an astonishingly high identification with being British among British Muslims. I find it astonishing that British Muslims still say that they feel British, given how hostile a lot of the press and the politicians are towards Muslims. But it is the case, actually, that when you look at the, the breakdown of the different ways in which Muslims identify themselves, there is a very strong identity um, as, being, uh, as being British among most Muslims um, in, in this country, in Britain. We also know that the real barriers to integration are racism and austerity, and that actually the policies that the government are implementing are actually much more likely to drive people um, into more isolation um, and, and more defensive and isolated communities. But also, it's the case that we know that this idea of British values is an absolutely ridiculous, yet a very popular concept. It's absolutely central to the government's prevent strategy. It's also, I don't know if you remember last year, Louise Casey, um, a character who just keeps popping up with the most terrible reports and terrible plans and strategies. She was the homelessness star at one point, wasn't she? Now I think she's the integration czar. But she did a report last year basically arguing that Muslims aren't doing enough to integrate, um, and particularly targeting Muslim women, surprise, surprise, yet again, uh, Muslim women are at the, at the brunt of this and saying that Muslim women are too isolated and don't learn enough English, and also arguing that people should be asked to um, swear an integration oath, which I, I, don't think, I don't know what that means, but anyway... There you go. That would solve the problems, apparently. But the idea of British values, obviously, there are so many things wrong with this. Um, the idea that all British people are the same and have the same values, the idea that we have the same values as Theresa May is an absolute nonsense, or Tony Blair, having mentioned one of our favourite old villains, or a whole number of other people. Our society is absolutely riven by class, by division, by racism, by austerity. We are not all in it together. And the idea that there is one set of British values that we all adhere to is a nonsense. The idea that the British state adheres to any of the so-called British values of freedom, democracy, fairness, justice is an absolute joke. And there's also something quite racist about saying that these are British values, that nobody from any other part of the world could ever have thought that freedom or justice were a good idea. This is only a British thing, apparently. So these are completely ridiculous ideas, and yet these are ideas that are used once again to beat Muslims with. And alongside this comes the very um, 
the idea that Muslims are somehow more sexist or more homophobic than any other part of society. Um, th this is an old argument as well, and this is one of the arguments that was used to justify not just the war in Iraq, but the Gulf War that went before that and the war in Afghanistan, that Muslim societies are really sexist and we have to liberate women by dropping bombs on them and killing them because this is a known strategy for liberating people. But the, in the PREVENT programme, again, people who've been questioned by PREVENT officers often say that one of the things that school children are being dragged out of class and questioned about is what is their attitude towards homosexuality, because this is a test of whether you're a terrorist. And as we know, there are huge numbers of homophobes in the Cabinet who don't get asked this sort of... Um, this sort of question. It's an absolute um, insult. But the question of integration is also at the centre of what Le Pen has done in France, is that her argument is that Muslims from North African descent can't integrate into French society and are therefore part of some sort of enemy within, within the French state. So this is an argument that goes beyond Britain to the rest of society. And linked to the question of integration is really what I think is the third argument, which is around the question of demographics. The idea and the fear that's whipped up, the title of Aaron Kundani's book, The Muslims Are Coming, the idea that Muslims are somehow taking over. And this is linked, I think, to quite nasty biological ideas of breeding. Um, because it's the idea that Muslims are now breeding so that they can take over society. And so every so often we have the scare stories about this. You know, um, you will remember that there's a number of no-go areas for non-Muslims in Britain, including the whole of Birmingham, <laughs> you'll remember. So, um, yeah, anyway... But this happens every so often, that there is a scare story about, you know, um, this part of Europe is going to be taken over by Muslims, Muslims are breeding too fast, or certain wards or certain constituencies in, in Britain are going to have um, more and more Muslims. In actual fact, if you look at the figures, there, there is actually Muslims only make up 4% of Europe's population, and there is no country in Europe where Muslims make up more than 7% of that country. So all of these scare stories obviously bear no resemblance to reality. They're all based on whipping up racism and they're based on absolute myths. And if it is true that Muslims are concentrated, as it is in some areas of Britain, that is because of poverty. Because actually, thank you, actually nearly half of England's Muslim population actually lives in the 10 most deprived local authority areas in Britain. So if there is a lack of integration, that is because of the systematic discrimination that Muslims face that is pushing them into poverty and pushing them into the poorest local authority areas in Britain. And actually there was another report that came out last year that had lots of problems in it by Ted Cantor, but it also showed that actually the areas that are becoming less integrated is actually down to white people moving out into the suburbs and leaving people who can't afford to move into the suburbs black people, Asian people, Muslims, actually concentrated in the poorer areas in the city centres. But these three arguments around terrorism, integration and demographics are all combined through Islamophobia to form this idea of a dangerous enemy within. The kind of the Trojan horse motif or the fifth column motif. The Trojan horse motif is a motif that actually you see written again and again over the last five, ten years. You will remember in, in Birmingham, the stuff about the schools was the Trojan horse scandal. There's also been a number of other incidents where people talk about Muslims as a Trojan horse, as an inside threatening um, community, and we can talk about that if we have time. It, we should also say, um, if it hasn't become obvious from what I've said already, that the attacks on Muslims and the stereotypes that are generated around Muslims are highly gendered. The focus on what women wear as being a problem has become a huge issue right across Europe uh, and in America actually but across Europe obviously in France this has been a huge issue with legislation to ban women from wearing um, the veil the hijab the in in public places um, also in Britain this is a central part of, of UKIP's thing and every so often there's a big argument about this this question at the same time, men, male Muslims are seen as terrorists or as sexual predators. You think about the whole stuff around the grooming scandal, that the way in which Muslim men are portrayed in that. And 
actually Islamophobia isn't just something that should concern Muslims because the rise in Islamophobia actually also feeds and encourages other forms of racism. It legitimizes the state, it legitimizes some of the, well it attempts to legitimize some of the attacks on refugees, um, it also uh, legitimizes some of the attacks on freedom of expression, defense of Palestine, it spreads over into a much wider questions I think of, um, of, of the right to protest and a whole number of other things. Now I want to move on really from just talking about Islamophobia to talking a little bit about secularism because as I explained Islamophobia comes from the top of society and it's easy to see why it's embraced by the far right, why it's embraced by the Tories, why the right wing love this policy. They use it to divide and rule, they use it to create scapegoats and they use it to divert attention and responsibility away from their um, adventure, misadventures and their murderous schemes in the Middle East. So it's easy to see why it benefits the ruling class. But the problem that we also face is that a lot of the left accept some Islamophobic ideas. Here's some figures from the 2014 Global Attitudes, Pew Global Attitudes study across Europe, and they found negative attitudes to Muslims, mostly obviously by those on, who express right-wing ideas, but also significant numbers on the left too. So in France, 47 of people who define themselves as having right-wing views had anti-Muslim views and 17% of those on the left, I would imagine that's a much higher figure now actually um, on both of those in, fr in France the way that the debate has gone um, over the, the past few years since 2014 in Spain 54% on the right have, have some kind of anti-Muslim views and 38% of people on the left express some kind of anti-Muslim views and here in Britain in case we think we're immune 34% of people on the right have anti-Muslim views and 19% of people who define themselves as somewhere on the left have some kind of anti-Muslim views. So why is this? Why would the left fall for this sort of nonsense? Well, I think the problem is that significant sections on, on the left fail to understand what I started with, that this is actually about racism. They accept instead a version of what's going on that sees a key divide but as being between what they see as progressive secular ideas against what they see as a reactionary idea of religious obscurantism. And secularism at its most basic is the idea that the state and religion should be separate. But it has come to mean in our modern age a much something different, a kind of a militant opposition to religion that in theory opposes all religions. We're against all religions equally. We don't think religion should play any major role in our society but we know in reality is targeted at Muslims in specific and at the very least means a failure to defend Muslims when they're persecuted and at its worst means complicity and involvement in that persecution and if you look at what's happened in France it's an absolute tragedy that it has actually been figures on the left who have played key roles in the trade unions in France in persecuting Muslims in the education system for example. Now, this, there are lots of arguments against this form of secularism. Firstly, obviously, that it ignores the reality of racism faced by Muslims. It fails to understand that this is a question of dealing with racism. Um, the idea is obviously the clearest in France, but we shouldn't believe it doesn't exist here. But in France, it has become very clear that the ideas of secular republicanism have led whole sections of the left to embrace actually a form of soft nationalism. If you look at the massive rallies that have been happening, very encouraging in support of Jean-Luc Mélenchon, a left-wing figure who actually came very close to the candidates for the um, presidential election, and, and that's brilliant. He's a left-wing guy, and it's great to see left-wing rallies, but his rallies were full of people waving the tricolor flag, and there is a, a sense in France that actually even sections of the left are dominated by a kind of national adherence to the questions of the republic, and with that goes the question of um, secularism. Um, and actually in France, a lot of the arguments on the left hark back to some kind of pride in the separation of the church and state in France and the idea that the French Republic is progressive because in 1905 they passed the law to separate the, the role of the church from the state. Now this, this um, I'm just going to have to say a couple more things and then I will stop. This 
is obviously um, in 1905, they did separate the church and the state, and it was a really big deal in France at the time because the Catholic Church was a very reactionary force. It had opposed revolutions in the past. It had tried to restore the monarchy after the revolutionary upheavals of 1789 to 99. So actually, for French society to separate the Catholic Church from the state was a progressive move. However, the law separating the church and state in 1905 was about removing the power of the church from the government, but actually it was also about guaranteeing the freedom of expression and freedom of religion to individuals, whatever their religion was in France. So this version of secularism actually wasn't what it's caricatured as today, which is about crushing religions. It was about trying to guarantee people the rights to freedom of religion without their without facing persecution. And in actual fact, there was an attempt to amend that law in 1905 to ban religious clothing that priests wore because they said, that much in the same way that they say today about women wearing the hijab, they said it was a sign of servitude and it should be banned and it shouldn't be part of the republic going forwards. And that was defeated because people said, as soon as you separate church and state, that becomes a garment like anyone else's and people have the right to express themselves in the way that they want to. So actually, even the things that the French are drawing on as their great glorious history of secularism are actually completely flawed and miss the point of, of what it was about. And this is not just a problem in France. This is a problem in other parts of the world. It's actually, if you think about somewhere like India, where actually there are large sections of the left in India who have fallen for the idea that India is a more progressive state than Pakistan because India is secular and Pakistan is a religious, seen as a religious state. And it has led to a situation, again, where there's been sections of the left in India that have failed to defend Muslims in India against some really nasty pogroms and attacks there. And as I say, this is an argument in France, it's an argument in India, but we shouldn't believe that it's not an argument in sections of the left in Britain. Now, in Britain, we have a better tradition than that. You think about the anti-war movement, and you think about the massive mobilisations that we've had against racism and fascism in Britain, we've made sure that Muslims are at the centre of those, and we haven't placed any conditions on that. We've been willing to work with people in all the... the, the however they want to dress, funnily enough, and however they want to come, and however they want to identify into those movements. And I'll finish on this, really, because times are tough, but the Islamophobes are not getting it their own way. We think about America, where Trump has tried this vicious anti-Muslim bans, and the response has been magnificent, not just in America, but about, around the world, people demonstrating and opposing that, and the ban actually being, being forced onto the back foot. Preventing this country is widely discredited. I think about when we started campaigning around this and raising this a few years ago. Actually, now there are many figures, not just on the left, even in, in government circles, who say that prevent is, is no longer a credible tool to be used. And we have built a brilliant tradition of mass mobilisation. You think about the victory of the Rotherham 12 in Sheffield, for example, a fantastic victory that shows that we can win victories in this current climate. But we should also remember that Muslims are not just victims and that Muslims are not all the same. Muslims are among some of the poorest groups in Britain, but at the same time, there are 10,000 Muslim millionaires in Britain. It's, Muslims are riven by class divisions, the same as anybody else's, and people have different interests um, among Muslims and different politics um, and different, live different lives as well. But we should also remember that Muslims aren't just interested in foreign policy. Muslims are workers, are trade unionists, are parents, are students, have been part of much of the hidden history of building the trade union movement and fighting against racism um, in Britain as well. But Muslims also can't fight alone. Attacks on Muslims are attacks on all of us. And we have to continue to build a united movement that can involve Muslims, but can also bring together black and white, black, Asian, gay, straight, all of us in a united movement that smashes Islamophobia and other forms of racism as well as austerity.